Um, so this is uh, a theme that has been uh, part of the next generation biophysics for a few meetings now, uh, imaging across scales. And um, we're going to start with our first speaker, who's Andreas Frutiger, who's going to talk to us about a new uh, methodology called uh, focal monography. So over to you, Andreas. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the introduction, Joe. So, so uh, it's quite an honor to be here. Thanks a lot to Maria for the invitation that uh, we are a small company, that we have the opportunity to present our technology to such a wide audience. So what I'm going to talk about today is label-free interaction analysis in complex samples. Mm -hmm. Label-free interaction analysis is the real realm of surface-based biosensors in that sense. And the gold standard for this is SPR. And we will learn today how you actually can make such a technology robust that it works in complex samples. I'm Andreas Frutiger. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Lina Biotech AG. We're a spin-off from ETH Zurich and Hoffmann Laros. We started in 2014 to develop this technology, but we're only two years old. And we're currently developing the first commercial reader for focal monography. With me, we're a team of only seven people that are pushing this forward. And I do not have an acknowledgement slide, but there is one person I would like to mention in this entire thing because it would not have happened without him. And this is Christoph Fottinger. He's a physicist or was a physicist at Roche. He had the idea of this principle 25 years ago. He told himself, well, technology is not ready yet. I wait another 14 and then I will file the patent for it. And that was in 2011. And then we started in 2014. So the outline of the talk. First, I quickly show you concentration affinity measurements in complex sample, why this is important. And then we really work us through how you can build a robust and sensitive biosensor. And there's three pillars to this. Then we see that monography is such a biosensor. And then I think it gets interesting for you because this has really nice applications when it comes to drug screening in living cells. So why do we at all care about concentration, kinetics, and affinity measurement? Because this is what this talk is about. So the, with these biosensors, you measure kinetics, affinity, and concentrations of molecular interactions. And they're actually important in many fields, not only drug discovery and structural biology and research, but also diagnostics and especially also bioprocessing when you want to have a feedback of your bioreactor. And the issue is, most biosensors nowadays, they measure in pure buffers, pure solutions, but actually biology is happening in this environment. So what we would actually like to do is to measure inside this complex, crowded environment of cells or complex samples, specific interactions. And as I said, you need a robust and sensitive biosensor that is built on three pillars. And focal monography, just the schematic here, is such a biosensor. And we will see in this talk that it outperforms the state of the art. This is a BioCore 8K, a surface plasma resonance machine that is used for label free interaction studies in terms of suppression of environmental noise. That means temperature and non specific binding noise. So, what is the basis of a concentration, a kinetic, or an affinity measurement? You actually need to be able to observe molecules. So, you need to be if you look at this is the COVID receptor and this is an antibody for it, if you look at the binding of this molecule to the other one, what happens in the interaction volume is that some water molecules are displaced from this site and then they go back afterwards. And from this, we would like to generate a sensor ground or a binding curve from which we then can extract the kinetic and thermodynamic parameters of these interactions. So this is our interaction volume. And what changes in this volume? What properties of biomolecules are different compared to water molecules from a very physical standpoint? There are actually only two properties that are quite common to, to molecules and um, water, biomolecules and water molecules. One is the refractive index, the optical density, and the other one is the mechanical density. And if you probe this volume, you actually get various physical phenomena that can happen up, upon your wave that you use in order to um, interrogate this. One is wave retardation, scattering, resonance changes, and the plantora of technique like surface acoustic wave, quartz crystal microbalance, continental beams to measure this change. On the optical side, 
you have the same effects basically when you probe it. Wave retardation, scattering, resonance changes, and you can use interferometry, interferometric detection of scattering. Some of you might know Refine, who was here a couple of years ago. They use this technology to detect molecular aggregation, diffraction, surface plasma resonance, and gradient couplers. You also can build a biosensor based on charge difference and hydrodynamic radius, but these are less popular up to now. So what is the challenge with these label-free measurements? Well, the issue is mechanical density and optical density that change in your interaction volume. These are general properties. So temperature will influence it, buffer changes will influence it, and also other molecules will influence it that come into this volume. So it's not selective for the binding of your analyte or the interaction you want to measure. And actually, it gets even worse. Because one interaction is not sufficient for a concentration or an affinity measurement. Because first, molecules are tiny, and these are ensemble properties. So by definition, you need to measure more than one binding event to accurately measure them or to have an overall response. The question is, how to best observe binding events, only probe where they happen. And I think in this community, I will not now get a lot of comments. From, this is not a little free biosensor and so on. but a surface has a tremendous advantage that you can use a phenomenon that is called total internal reflection. And total internal reflection generates you on the other side of the substrate, a evanescent wave. And the refractometric sensing principle is basically you measure the refractive index change in this illuminated volume and you try to correlate it to the binding event. And you immediately see the benefits of this evanescent field. So you have constrained the sensing volume in one dimension to only the surface, and you're extremely surface sensitive. And you also get a high sensitivity through a resonance enhancement. In the case of surface plasma resonance, you have the plasma. So actually, we've discovered our first pillar for a sensitive and robust biosensor. And this is one should use an evanescent wave at the surface to illuminate or probe your molecules. And actually, many of the biosensors in the state of the, art, uh, state of the art are using evanescent waves to probe the molecules. The most prominent one is surface plasma resonance, A on the very right, where you use a prism, you launch a plasma, you measure the angle, and you can correlate this back to the refractive index change. So in principle, these are extremely sensitive techniques. But requirement is sensitivity all that you need to measure uh, interactions no it's really uh, an, another story if you take one of these sensors and you put it into a biological environment your surface looks usually like this there is no non-fouling surface you have always tons of molecules that bind to your sensor surface and now it's challenging right to correlate your specific binding event that you want to measure to everything else. And also, um, if you uh, change the temperature, so the resolution of these sensors is one, uh, 0.1 microrefractive index units, and this corresponds to a temperature increase of 1,000 of a degree. If your measurement, uh, if your device changes by more than that, you already have a drift that is larger than the resolution of the techniques. Or you put one drop of DMSO into a 10 liter bucket and you have the same effect. So since many drugs are stored in DMSO or drug candidates, this is a huge issue. So the bottom line is these refractometric evanescent field sensors, they're still extremely cross sensitive. Now the question is, is there a way, we are measuring refractive index, is there a way that we can separate the contribution from the analyte binding due to uh, to uh, from all the other changes from environmental noise and no specific binding, and yes, there is by adding internal referencing and making sure that the noise components of environmental noise are correlated. The second one is extremely important because many of you might now think, Well, okay, I have my sensing surface and I just put a reference next to it. Well, that's not how it works, and we will discover. <laughs> In this talk, 
then because there's a huge difference whether you do the referencing like this or whether you do a distributed referencing within your sensor spot. So basically what you would like to have ideally is that you have your specific interaction volume and you would like to have your interaction volume with a mutated binding site and you would like to subtract the two and then repeat this over the entire sensor. That would be the ideal robust biosensor. Now, we would like to understand why is this better than doing macroscopic referencing. And for this, we need to look at the length scales of this environmental noise. How is it distributed? And it's, a, in fact, you can show that most of the environmental noise is over long time scales, long length scales and time scales. And this is because everything is governed by the advection diffusion equation. And since the, the speed of diffusion, whether it's temperature or concentration, is finite, gradients and concentration, it should be intuitively clear that over nanometer scales, they will relax much faster than over millimeter and meter scales. So you have less noise on these scales. And if you pop the power spectrum, so basically the noise is a function of spatial frequency, you see that most of the noise power is at the origin, so at long time scale, uh, long length scales. And now it should also be clear why a sensor that is not referenced is not a good biosensor, because your signal is then at the origin. You, you measure all the drift changes. And if you do a macroscopic reference, your spatial frequency is still close to the size of the sensor. So you're still close to the origin. You're not moved very far on the axis of spatial um, periods. So you still overlap with the environmental noise. However, if you do a distributed reference, you actually have the so-called lock-in frequency or the frequency of your analyte binding is suddenly at a very high frequency where there's hardly any noise. So you've, by doing this, you have separated the noise contributions from basically the signal that you expect, your binding signal. And the ideal, um, uh, length scale will be that you go as low as possible to the molecular length scale, so 5 to 10 nanometers for macromolecules. And that is the second pillar that we discovered. So to have a robust sensor, you should do referencing close to the molecular length scale and repeat this all over. Now the problem is how to measure this. This is, if you have a large sensor spot, you would actually now need to sample everything with extremely high resolution. Well, it's well known from radio transmission. If you modulate something, you can also demodulate it. The entire internet is based on this. The only difference, it's done in time and not in space. And we did it in space and not in time. If you want to transfer something in a noise environment, you need to modulate it. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, we can actually detect the signal in real space or we can go to Fourier space where everything is separated. So if you detect the signal in Fourier space, you see that this has a lot of advantages because the noise is separated. That means the sampling can be coarse. So you only measure this volume of Fourier space, noise and signal are separated, and your measurement precision can be low. However, if you would do this in real space, you need fine sampling. You need to acquire the entire sensing volume, signal noise, uh, noise overlap and hit the same detector. And you need a high dynamic range because you always acquire this, the noise with the signal. And then at the end, you need to um, basically um, deconvolute the tool. Now, the session is called Imaging at Scale. <laughs> we exactly lose this information, to be honest. So we do not know where the binding occurs on the sensor surface, but we don't care because it's a concentration or an affinity measurement, which is an ensemble measurement. In the other case, you would know where it occurs. So this is actually the way how you can demodulate the signal. You should directly measure in Fourier space and not in real space. So now you might ask, well, how can we perform this Fourier transformation without a computer? And there are ways to do that. Any wave phenomena does a Fourier transformation. It was actually optical computers have been developed before the real computer, and you can use acoustics or optics to do that. So what do they have in common? The bulk wave phenomena. And from crystallography or from, from your high school classes, you know that 
if you have scatterers or obstacles placed in a regular pattern, you shine away from it, you have this spherical waves forming. And this, you can basically then draw new waves, and this is nothing but diffraction. And if you change the spacing, you also change this diffraction angle. And suddenly you have linked spatial periods to angles, and angles you can measure. So here's your Fourier transformation. Diffraction can perform a Fourier transformation. But is diffraction enough? If you have your sensor surface, you have the issue that actually these different spatial periods overlap for a considerable amount of propagation distance. Now, there's a trick you can apply. You can just put a lens in between, and suddenly, even close to the chip, you have everything nicely separated. And after this long introduction, I come basically to focal homography because focal homography is now a biosensor that implements all these principles. So we have a laser beam that is guided by a waveguide that hits a structure that is a diffractive lens. It's a Fourier lens. And basically what we do, we force the analyte to bind in a ordered structure on our surface. And by measuring the intensity that is diffracted in this focal point, you can directly back calculate how many molecules have bound on this structure. And anything which happens uniformly or randomly, or when you change the structure 90 degrees, doesn't generate a signal. So you don't see it. The locking period is, is quite small. So visible light um, is quite um, useful because we're already close to this molecular length scale. For sure, you could use uh, other phenomena like acoustics, but this is three orders of magnitude lower, so much more noise because the spacing will be larger. You could use E-beam or X-rays. Not so sure whether you want to do a, a living sample with these kind of phenomena, so it's too damaging. Now, what we have uh, at Lino Biotechs, actually, we do not only have one sensor, but we have 54 of these spots, so you can actually do multiplexing of it. And just to show you animation how this actually works. So this is our reader that we envisioned them to build. And here you see the chip. And it also visualizes how the principle works in quite a, a nice way. So you have these lines that are chemically functionalized such that your antibody only binds on these lines. And then basically, you illuminate it from the side. The uh, wavelength is not to scale, it's a marketing video. <laughs> but you see that all of these binders, they scatter a little bit of the light and the depicted light rays, they go into a certain direction. And then now a target binds, you see that the scattering intensity of each of these binders increases. And since they converge all into a spot, if we now zoom out by measuring only the Spot, look, uh, spot intensity, you know how many molecules are there. Now, how good is it to the state of the art? So if you compare focal homography to um, uh, this uh, Biocore 8K, the current instrument, if you do measurements over time, just to see how much this drifts, you see that homography is basically drift free, whereas the Biocore 8K drifts away, even though this machine is temperature stabilized and this one is not. If you want to change your buffer or you have DMSO in your samples, you see, even in a referenced SPR, you see spikes because the sensor surfaces are not the same over these length scales. Whereas in uh, focal homography, you hardly have any change. And now we start moving from the technical aspects to the um, biology. I think now it's getting a bit more interesting for most of you. <laughs> What is quite remarkable, when you start flushing a complex sample over such a sensor, in this case, it was just a biotin sensor that detects streptavidin. Green is PBS, blue is serum, and blood is red. So at time point I, we start injecting or changing the buffer to serum or blood, and you see that the sensor doesn't respond. All other biosensors will give you a huge signal in this case. And then when the specific analyte comes, you see the on rate of, of the streptavidin. It's almost the same in uh, buffer and in blood. Sure, the response is a bit lower because platelets also bind a little bit to the sensor surface, but the kinetics should be the same. 
The blue curve is different because it's in travidine and not stractavidine, so the kinetics is different. Good. Let's go to the applications. I think this technology has really a lot of potential when you combine it with studies in um, living cells. So a huge problem that you have when you would like to, to, to find a target for a GPCR is that current binding studies in SPR, they measure a change of the cell. And a change can be due to various reasons. You do not know whether it's the activation of your GPCR that is causing that. So there's really an issue that you can have your functional assays, which are very specific, but these binding assays, they're extremely non-specific, non-targeted. And if you combine cell-based um, cells with molography, you actually can do this because what is happening? If you start seeding cells that contain a um, SNAP tag, a SNAP tag labeled um, GPCR in their membrane, these um, proteins in the cell membrane start assembling in this line pattern. So what is happening, because they can move freely, they start assembling, and then what is happening, you start transferring this sensor structure on the inside of the living cell. So suddenly you have your GPCRs ordered in a 100 nanometer pattern within the cell. And we have more than one line within the cell. So we have a referencing in the cell. So we don't see changes in whether the cell grows or, or shrinks or changes mass. So you can really look at the molecule itself. And you see it here. So you have the binding of the GPCR to the monogram, and then you can actually start doing interaction studies. And you only see in the binding signal what is happening to this specific receptor. And the rest is not there. And this is completely label-free unless, um, unless it's tethered to the surface. That's the only label we have. And what we did is we, we did it for the beta arsteen receptor. On time point A, you see actually the, the binding signal where the um, GPCR starts binding to these lines. And then what is interesting is the next thing. Um, so basically, if you, if, you, um, if you don't express this GPCR, you don't see this first signal increase at all. It's just a flat line, but this is not shown here. But now if you zoom in into this um, small location here, what we did there is actually we started stimulating the GPCR. So we uh, added isoproterenol, which would activate it and lead to arrestine recruitment. And actually, we can see the arrestine recruitment to this GPCR. And if you add a uh, competitive agonist, I'm not a biologist, so uh, <laughs> then the signal decreases again. And we also combined the, the dose response curve that you obtained from this signal to a classical breath, breath assay, and you see actually it correlates quite well. What could this be used for, basically? Oh, sorry, let's go back. So you could actually quantify, quantify to what binding partner something binds. You can make concentration response curve. But I think what is extremely interesting is receptor deorganization. If you do not know what activates your GPCR, you could use this system and flow different tissue extracts over it and see when the system starts responding to limit to maybe limit the, the kind of tissues where this GPCR might be active. This is just uh, the off target control. So if uh, you use NECA, which um, uh, activates adesinone on GPCR, which is also present, you don't see a response of the sensor. And if you compare it to the isoproterenol, you see a nice um, increase due to arrestine binding. If you do the uh, arrestine knockout, you basically have a flat line. It's in the paper, I didn't show it here. And if you then reintroduce the beta arrestine plasmid into the beta arrestine knockout, you get the signal increase again. So this should show you that it's actually the arrestine recruitment. You could even play this a bit further uh, by actually, and, and we did this in 2020, by actually um, starting to generate artificial transmembrane constructs. So the only prerequisite is that you bring your binder, your interaction to the surface of the cell close to the sensor surface. So you could design constructs that span the membrane that have a binder like a dart pin or that is actually stable inside um, the reducing environment of the cell that binds inside the solid protein. 
And now you suddenly can study all the cytosolic protein protein interactions inside living cells. And you can start thinking about multiplexing this to different targets and, and actually see signaling cascades evolve in real time in the living cell at the end of the day. So let me wrap up. What can the machine do at the end of the day? So for drug screening, what is really interesting, you have on one hand this um, specific response of the GPCR. This is diffractometric channel. Then you have a fluorescence sensor built in because it's a fluorescence microscope as well. So it can do all the calcium signaling assays with it as well. And you also get the classical biosensing signal because by tracking this spot, which you anyways have to do, this correlates to the total amount of mass on the on the sensor surface. So there you actually see whether the cell is round, rounding up or where the overall proteins are binding to the surface with all the problems that come with that. So it's not robust. So we really have all these different things combined in one machine. I think that makes it really interesting for, for drug screening. With this, I would like to conclude. I used a lot of time of my talk to explain you these three principles, how to build a robust and sensitive biosensor, but it's really quite unique because in signal processing, information transmission, this principle has been known since decades, but somehow no one applied it to chemical sensing, and it's really the way how to recover a signal in a lot of noise. And I hope that I've shown you that Focomolography is really a technology that implements this, and by this is intrinsically robust against all kinds of environmental influences. And now you can start to do really interesting applications like affinity ranking of binders in cell culture supernatants without any purification. You can just put your hybridoma supernatant on this. You can an analyze strong binders. That's a huge issue because then the base baseline of the sensors usually drift off of the state of the art. And for this community, I mean, this guy's still living. Think about what you can do with, with uh, drug screening or signaling cascade observation in, in living cells. It's not only PowerPoint, we actually have readers. So we're most spin off. Next year, we will have uh, a few um, readers placed at our customers. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, any questions for Andreas? Hi, I'm Nika Decker from TU Delft. Uh, I thought it was very interesting, your talk. Uh, thank you. Okay. And you talked a lot about using this to look at cascades, right, uh, in cells. But you could also use it in vitro, right? So let's say you had an array of, of molecules and you wanted to see an assembly cascade of a protein complex, would that be possible? Using yeah, sure, it's a platform technology. I mean, you could use it in all the organ on a chip experiments to see whatever cytokines are expressed over time monitoring cell culture. It's really, you need to find one application to get started and yeah. then we can do the rest. Okay, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Some waffle lesson. <laughs> Hi, that um, was a really interesting talk. I was wondering if you'd had the opportunity to test this oh, yeah, in yeah, sorry. the microphone on. Yeah. Is it? Okay, that's just my soft spoken yeah. voice. <laughs> sorry about that. Shout. Sorry, I'll, I'll try and shout. So um, that was a really interesting talk. I was wondering if you'd had the opportunity to test this in instances where you're mm -hmm. looking at more complex solutions so that you may know what the challenges might be when you have less defined systems. So you said that you could take the GPCR and test all sorts of lysates to mm -hmm. see whether you could deorganize. Have you actually tried to do that? Not yet, no. Just because of resource issues. But I think it would be quite interesting if you had the system established and then you can try to narrow down where stuff is expressed. I, I think with a lot of new technologies, often when people broaden out the applications, they find what the challenges are. And I think this is, has been the same with SPR. Yeah. You know, how do you control for the fact that you've got all sorts of other things there that may not be quite as specific as your test system? So that will be really interesting to find out. Question here. If only a few entities bind at random on your arrays, I would not expect the diffraction signal to be very strong. Do you have curves of the diffraction signal as a function of concentration? 
Uh, yes, but not in this um, it is in this presentation. So basically, well, actually, yes, you do in the backup slide. <laughs> so you can do anything with this sensor um, that you can do with the classical direction analysis sensor. And here's a endpoint affinity determination. This is concentration, and this is the sensor response that you get. So it depends on the mass of your molecule, how strong the signal is. Um, from the baseline noise that we have, the, the minimum, the absolute minimum in the best conditions was six and a half thousand streptavidin molecules that we were able to see. Also, not molecules, but from the noise, you could infer that this is the amount of molecules you would see. One more, I think. In buffer. This was not in the complex. So a question from online. Someone's asking, um, what is the range of affinities you can measure with this technology? Well, at the end of the day, this will, this will depend how long you're willing to wait. <laughs> Let's put that especially for extremely uh, highly affine binders. Um, we didn't, uh, how shall I say, we didn't really investigate it. So we can for sure do nanomolar to micromolar. For millimolar, I think we do not have the temporal resolution at the moment. We are at one hertz. Okay, I think in the interest of time, we'll stop there. Uh, thank Andreas again. Uh, any further questions, please post them online or catch Andreas at the break.